Welcome to um, an event which is a sad one overall, which is a panel to remember Harlan Ellison. I'm Tom Whitmore, I'll be the moderator. I'm going to let each of the other people introduce themselves in just a moment. But I have a request for both the panelists and anyone in the audience who gets a chance to speak if we don't take up the time. Each one of us on the panel could fill two hours of Harlan Ellison stories without repeating ourselves. And each one of them would keep you enthralled far beyond my ability to uh, understand. I would like people to keep their recollections about Harlan to things that they personally experienced, whether it's an experience about his writing or about him in person, yes, I him in a group, so him you're, you're all by himself, because stories accrete on Harlan like barnacles on a ship. <laughs> <laughs> and many of those stories are true. Many of them are not. If we hold it to things we personally experience, I think we can do more honor to the man and remember him as he actually was. Warts and all. So, having said that, I will quickly say folks' names, then each person take a little bit of time to say something. We have Bob Silverberg, Chris Barkley, David Gerald, Christine Volata, and Matt Segala. And each of them has an intimate connection to Harlan. Um, as do I. You know, I, I knew Harlan since 1969, which puts me sort of in the middle of the amount of time people here have known him. But, Bob, you knew him longest and you knew him first, so why don't you start us off? Okay. I am Robert Silverberg, you know who I am. I knew Harlan for 65 years, <sighs> and I could tell you our own stories for the next 65 years. <laughs> uh, we roomed together at my first Worldcon, which was the 1953 Worldcon in Philadelphia. And there were two defining incidents at that Worldcon that will serve to explain Harlan to you uh, if you didn't know him or even if you did. Uh, he had offended a fan from New York by saying something <laughs> correct about him. <laughs> <laughs> and the fan said, I am coming down to the Philadelphia Convention with two of my friends and we're going to beat you up. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I arrived at the hotel, it was the, the Bellevue Stratford Hotel in Philadelphia, a really posh place. That was the Worldcon Hotel, you know, we only had one at that time. <clears throat> I came into the lobby, and at the other end of the lobby, where the registration desk was, there were three tall, uncouth-looking men standing in front of a very small man. And I realized that has to be Harlan. We, we had never met, although we had been in contact for a year or so. And those are the three guys who have come down to New York <laughs> to beat him up. Well, I wonder what's going to happen. I'm not a warrior. I did not rush down there to say, I'll go your side. And he was staring up at them, and they were saying things to him. And then he said things to them. And then they went away. <laughs> I never knew what he said to them, but it indicated he had defeated them with six sentences. Wow. Well, later that weekend, uh, might even have been the same night, we went to dinner at a Chinese restaurant in uh, Philadelphia, Chinatown. And as a waiter carrying a heavily laden tray passed our table, Harlan reached up and took a dumpling off the tray <laughs> and ate it. And I looked at him because I wasn't brought up that way. <laughs> well, those two anecdotes tell you really all you need to know about Harlan. He was utterly fearless. Those three guys from New York did not frighten him in the slightest. He scared them away. And he was outrageous. In the middle of a crowded Chinese restaurant, he would steal a dumpling from a passing waiter without giving a second thought. 
We had a long and tumultuous relationship. Um, we uh, took in each other's laundry, we helped each other where we could. Uh, we didn't actually fight, but we had one long period of estrangement where Harlan decided I had done something unforgivable, and I couldn't say, Harlan, you are too stupid to see that there's no problem here. <laughs> you can't say that. So we let it slide for some years, and then finally uh, I had a little medical problem in London, and when I got back from that trip, there was a phone message from Harlan saying, I uh, hear you, you haven't been well, uh, are you all right? And I emailed him and said, uh, if that's a simple courtesy, thank you. And if this is an attempt at a rapprochement, I'm all for it. <coughs> call, call me in three days when I'm over the jet lag. He did. And for the remainder of his life, we were back to where we were. And I talked with him. Uh, I lived in the Bay Area. He lived in Los Angeles. I talked with him every 10 days or so. The latter day Harlan, who had, had a stroke and was bedridden, was quite benign. Uh, this was not true of the Harlan that you may have seen in action from time to time. And we had lovely, charming conversations about the old days. Do you remember so and so? Do you remember so? Oh, he's dead, he's dead. He's dead. <laughs> uh, and then I wasn't surprised to hear his death. After all, he was 84 years old and had had a serious stroke. But the subtraction of this dynamic, hyperactive, brilliant man who had been part of my life for 65 years uh, left me bewildered. Where, where did he go? Where did he go? And I think we all feel that way, even those of you who had only the most glancing interactions with him. Uh, I knew him better than anybody, but you all got to know him quite well. And uh, when he was good, he was really good. <laughs> you know the next one. <laughs> My name is uh, Chris Barclay. I'm the senior black correspondent for File 770. <laughs> uh, I, I have to say at the beginning that I am not here by design. I'm here pinch hitting for someone who knew Harlan a lot, much, much better than I did, Adam Troy Castro. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, he could not make it, and I volunteered. I, I only knew Harlan for 41 years, so I'm kind of like a junior member here. Um, I, I, I was sitting, I was lying in bed this morning trying to think of what I would say, and I, it finally occurred to me that I actually I met Harlan three times before, well, two times before I actually met in the flesh. The first time was when I was eight years old, and I wasn't into the sophisticated stuff like the man from UNCLE or Burt's Law. No, no. I was into primal fear. Outer limits. Uh, I remember watching... I'm 62 years old. I, I remember watching in 1964 and 65 uh, these episodes of Outer Limits, Soldier and Demon with a Glass Hand. I recently rewatched them and was chilled by, by both, especially Demon with a Glass Hand, which still stands today as one of the best episodes of television ever written. And I, I lay quaking in fear afterwards. The, the thing about it was our limits usually dealt with monsters, but the monsters in Soldier were quite human. There were, there were no aliens, per se, just people in conflict and people trying to understand each other, which really, really touches me. The second time was in 1972 or 73. I had a neighbor of mine who I got into fandom with in 1976. Her name is Michael, Michael Jordan. Not that Michael Jordan. <laughs> but uh, we would exchange 
things I would do, things for uh, her mother like trick out to trash. She came home from college and she uh, was out of touch with comics. So I would give her the uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow series of comics written by uh, Denny O'Neill and drawn by Neil Adams. And she was shocked to find that Speedy was on drugs. So she, she decided to get even with me by giving me uh, the year's best science fiction edited by Terry Carr and Donald Woldheim. The 1970 issue had a boy and his dog. Uh, that was the first Harlan Ellison story I ever read. So I can say without hesitation, the person who started reading that story was not the same person at the end of the story. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, to get into fandom in 1976. And I started going around to a lot of conventions uh, when they were $5 memberships. <laughs> oh, God. And, and one of them was Kublai Khan number no. five, which was in Nashville. And I knew Harlan was going to be there. And I was so excited to be there. And there came the Saturday afternoon when he was doing a presentation. And he was the most ebullient and exciting person, writer I had ever seen in action. We had the opportunity of hearing him read uh, Working with the Little People and Jeff T. is Five. And the, him reading those stories, uh, he was so, well, you know. Um, and he made me want to even more so be a writer. Uh, I would not attempt to, to be like Harlan Ellison because I tried writing like Harlan Ellison. Nobody writes like Harlan Ellison. No one. And meeting him, having dinner with him, interacting with him over the next 41 years was some of the most exciting times of my life. I will never forget them. Uh, my name is David Gerald. And uh, I knew Harlan for 50 years. Uh, I think we were friends for about 30 of those years. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I, uh, I met Harlan at a uh, uh, little convention that replaced Westercon in 1968. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, and, you know, I introduced myself, and he said, yeah, nice episode, kid, and turned away. And I said, all right. <laughs> But we saw each other at, at Worldcon that year um, and uh, a few other gatherings in L.A., so he knew who I was. Um, and, we did, you know, there, there was no relationship there yet. Now, 1969 was possibly the single worst year of my life, and I'm not going to go into the details, but I hit bottom, and it was uh, where I was at a point of why am I even living, why do I even want to keep on living? I've never discussed this in public before. Mm. Um, and and uh, I, and there was nobody I could talk to, literally nobody on the planet who I trusted. But there was only one person I knew who might have insight. So I called Harlan, and I, you know I said, Harlan, this is David Gerald. I, have you got time? Because I need to. And he listened, and I told him everything. And I said, What do I do? And and he said, You know, just hang in there. But we were on the phone for over an hour. And he just listened, and he listened, and he listened. I said, well, I was thinking about this. He said, no, that isn't, you don't want to go there. Well, what about, the, no, don't do that. He said, and, and finally it was just, you know, hang in there, you're not alone. And that was it. That's a, pretty much, and I hung up the phone, and there, over the next few days, I, whatever bottom I was at, I started to see the light. And I said, what I actually, what happened was I went to the typewriter and started writing again and started just pouring all the emotion into the story I was working on at the time, and um, which was when Harley was one. Um, and just all the energy that had been, all that negative energy was just turned into some, the book. So from that moment on, it didn't matter what Harlan did, what he said, who was angry with him, because I knew he had saved my life, literally, in the literal sense of the word literally. I knew he had saved my life. and. Um, so it doesn't matter what anybody would say or do about Harlan. It was like, he's my brother. He's my mentor. You have, if you want to go 
after Harlan, you have to go through me. And, and I have just made that a rule for 50 years. And so uh, Harlan, and, Harlan was a role model and a mentor. And, and with Dangerous Visions, I said, oh, you know, we can move beyond the boundaries. And not just as storytellers, not just as writers, but as people, we had to be dangerous. And I got the very best acknowledgement I ever got from anybody from Harlan. We were uh, on the strike line, and people were interviewing him. <clears throat> and he says, you should interview David Gerald. And, uh, and, the, and then he says, he is the most courageous man I have ever met. And it took me a minute to realize what he was talking about. I had adopted a little boy. and. Uh, and I, and I always felt Sean was the one who was more courageous than me. He had to put up with me. But Harlan recognized that I had really stepped out of myself to adopt Sean, that I had reinvented that part of my life. So, um, and I realized at that moment how much he respected me, which I had always wanted to be worthy of his respect. He was, he was just this giant, shortest giant I have ever met. But. <laughs> <clears throat> But now, I, I, I will segue to one last memory. Uh, 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 it, this happened just a few months ago. Susan called me and said, we need to get Harlan to the doctor for a checkup. And we need uh, people who can lift him out of his bed. I said, I have a torn rotator cuff. Let me find some people who can lift him. And I asked around and found a couple of young Mormon elders <laughs> who were willing to uh, uh, lift Harlan into the wheelchair and into the car and then and we would go and get him in, into the doctor's office and then um, they arrived with uh, some books of Harlan's that they wanted signed a couple of books. <laughs> we uh, after the doctor's appointment we all went out to lunch at a little uh, Italian uh, deli and Harlan was a great with restaurants Harlan knew every great restaurant in the entire southwest and parts east and uh, so but we found a place he'd never been to a little Italian deli in Burbank and we went in and we had a great lunch Susan and Sharon me the two young Mormon elders Harlan and we, he was his old self, having a great time. He, he was getting to sample everybody's dinner. And, uh, and uh, he was charming. And it was like, for just that one day, it was getting a chance to be with the old Harlan again. And it was great. Um, the morning that he died, uh, my first impulse was to, call, was to call and find out how pissed off he was about dying. <laughs> Because he, I, I just cannot imagine a world without Harlan. I, to me, he's still alive up in Sherman Oaks and grumbling about the rest of us who are not living up to his standards. So um, he's still my mentor and role model and the standard I aspire to reach. Thank you. I was Harlan's... Uh, well, let's back it up. I, I first knew who Harlan Ellison was from some time in the 60s. Uh, I photographed him in passing for the Washington Post in 1980, um, but I wasn't introduced to Harlan until 1989. Um, I had started working on the project that I'm sure some of you have seen that's downstairs. And... Um, my, I was friends with Diane and Leo Dillon, who were old Harlan friends. And I said um, to Diane, I said, I know you're going to be at LesterCon. Uh, I need to photograph Harlan for this project. Do you suppose that you can introduce me so he will not bite my head off? <laughs> and they said, of course. Now, uh, so back in the days when you didn't have like 16 kinds of ID and didn't go through TSA, Peggy Ray Pavlat gave me miles. This is before you could do this with miles. Uh, she, she used her miles to, buy, to get me an airline ticket to come out in her name. And uh, I came out to California for WesterCon. Uh, the morning after I got there, I was walking down the hallway, or I, I guess it was the green room, and I ran into David, who I had first photographed in 1973. And Dave and, and I said, told him why I was there, and I said, I want to photograph you for this. And he said, great. A little later in the day, I walked down a hallway, and David was there talking to someone. And he, he introduced me to said someone as, this is somebody you should photograph. And I said, okay, great. So the next day, we did, we did the shoot, and uh, uh, he said to me, 
Oh, Harlan is a great friend of mine. I will, I will make sure that he's there for you to photograph. And I said, oh, okay, fine. So, uh, in fact, the next day, as I was waiting for Diane and Leo to show up with Harlan, I hear a commotion coming down the hallway. And uh, it's, an, I mean, it's an entourage. And <laughs> I hear, I have to go and get my fucking photograph taken so my friend can get laid. <laughs> I was getting on a plane that evening. <laughs> so, um, and it's like, and this is this is the rule for dealing with Harlan. You need to be fearless in return. Yes. You, yes, ne- yes. you need to be able. You needed to be able to stand up to him. So he comes up. The introduction is made, and I said, "Mr. Ellison, um, I, I believe we have something in common. We're both a whole lot bigger on paper than we are in person." <laughs> and he good dirty look spins on his heels to go the other way and Leo Dillon stood in front of him and said stop now so um, with that in mind uh, we uh, went for the session which was usually two rolls of, of two and a quarter film and a few black and white shots and, a pol- and a, a starting with Polaroid and I got ten shots out I knew number nine was the right one at which point he jumped off of his chair and start and you know to leave and and I thought I do have it. A week and a half later, I had sent the print, and I swear to God, I know when their phone their their mail is delivered, they couldn't have had the couldn't have done anything more than open the package, and I get a phone call, uh, and the phone call is like Miss Villada. Yeah. This is a really wonderful photograph. I'd like to use it on my next book jacket. <laughs> So Harlan, uh, the other thing to know about Harlan is what Harlan cared about was talent. And he nurtured so many people. um, And he was incredibly supportive of me over the years. And reader, I married him, the uh, the guy in the hallway. So I married into Harlan's circle. He was my friend for 30 years. He had been my husband's friend for an additional 20. There were... There were a number of Thanksgiving dinners. There was a period of estrangement. Um, I will, you know, say Thanksgiving was, there was the Thanksgiving that he and Connie Willis were sitting, uh, do, it was like watching a ping pong match. <laughs> Connie won, Harlan walked out. We didn't think he was gonna come back, but Susan was still there, so he had to come back for Susan. There was the Thanksgiving, uh, where Hanukkah fell on Thanksgiving and Harlan loved Hanukkah for being a lapsed Jew. He loved Hanukkah. So he lit the candles. He knew the prayers. Um, there was every time my husband was in the hospital until the last time the first person he saw when he came out of anesthesia was me and then Harlan because he was there for us all the time. So if you say anything bad about Harlan in front of me, you're likely to get an earful. He was many things. He was incredibly loyal. He was a, an incredible pain in the ass. Uh, he was he was high maintenance, which I told him, and he was so upset by the idea that he was high maintenance. That he, he called me repeatedly over the court, you know, and it's like, and it would, he'd bring it up again, and, and again, and again, and it's like, yeah, yeah, have you listened to yourself lately? Um, he was also my client for three years, and as a client, as a lawyer, you could not have a better client for intellectual property than Harlan Ellison. Every copyright was in order, every renewal was in order, all the paper was at his fingertips. And he was kind of a formidable opponent in a deposition. Um, you know, and it's, it's, you know, Susan and I have, are, have become very, very close friends and there was a plan in place and the plan in place was I was the first call that she was, she was gonna make. And the first call was, in fact, to 911, but I was the second call. And I was up at the house 
to help her make the arrangements for what needed to be done. Um, I do want to say that although I'm not happy with police a lot lately, uh, there was a, a black police officer and a Hispanic woman police officer, and they were lovely. Um, but uh, we made arrangements for Harlan to be cremated, and Forrest One came to take the body, and he looked so tight. For the longest time, and I don't know where it is right now, there was a, an, a piece of art in his bathroom, and it was a Billy Sunday, and what you see is a crowd of people, and you see a small person at a podium, but you see this big image of him projected behind, and that was Harlan. Yeah. He was a huge, huge personality, and he looked so tiny. Um, and I'm going to miss him a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I have to follow this. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've said this, and since you mentioned cremation, I've said this before. As we know, Harlan held grudges. He used to say he was still working off grudges from 1951. And I'm sure somewhere there's a list of people in whose faces he wants his ashes thrown. I'd like to see a show of hands. Okay. Uh, show of hands. Anybody who had personal contact with Harlan? A signing line, telephone? Wow. Yeah. Every okay, hand in the thank room. You. <laughs> and you know, he would not just sign an autograph, would he? He would have an exchange, he would talk, would ask something about you. He cared. He cared about individuals. I'm not sure he gave a shit about the people in general, but <laughs> the individuals he cared about because they cared about him. He, he returned what he received. Now, you can all read my hat. It says, writer. Have we all seen the screed that's been on YouTube from the <laughs> Nelson documentary, Pay the Writer? Um, yep. It speaks so well to how much we all love Harlan that we have a panel full of writers working for free. <laughs> Wait, what? Wait, we're not getting paid? What? I was promised American Express. Come on. <laughs> you didn't even get into this place for free. You kidding? It's all because we want to be here for Harlan. Uh, I have a couple of nephews. Uh, there's actually a, a segue here. And I said, okay, I think we should meet Harlan. This is when he was okay, before he'd had his stroke. And Harlan loves kids. He doesn't much care about adults, as you know, but he, he loves kids because they're honest and because they don't break anything. It's the adults who break the things in his house. And so I brought a little... Oh, he did uh, kick my son out of the house once for stepping on something. Oh, well, we're going to have some kinship here. Uh, <laughs> my nephew Adam was about uh, uh, eight at the time. His younger brother, Joseph Benjamin, who we called JB, was six. And uh, we went over to the house, and we didn't go into all the places, but I showed him around, and of course they only wanted the comic books. We're sitting around talking, and the younger one just starts to crawl up on Harlan, who's sitting in his chair, and starts to just play with his, his gray hair, and Harlan's holding him. I mean, it's like a plush toy. <laughs> and the other one says, okay, it, JB, it's time to go, and Adam, by mistake, steps on Harlan's foot. Harlan says... You goddamn klutz! <laughs> you stepped on my foot! Well, of course, the boys refused to give him the courtesy of being afraid. <laughs> I understood that he was kidding. And in fact, I happened to have videotaped that, and they made me play it back afterwards many times because he wanted to hear the expression goddamn klutz. <laughs> afterwards, of course, Hartnell said, there's no way the kid can hurt me. But it was, it was important to get some people over there to see Harlan because I knew he wasn't going to be around forever. And it's important for us as writers to tell stories so the future knows about the past. I wanted people to know about Harlan. That's, of course, why I uh, wrote the biography and why he asked me to write it. My publisher would be unhappy if I didn't hold it up for those of you taking pictures. <laughs> but Harlan kind of asked me to write it. Uh, there are many reasons, much speculation about this. But he gave me complete access to everything, including all the copyrighted material everything that I could possibly want to go into. And it was amazing. Of course, he had his stroke toward the end of my writing, and so I wanted to hurry it so he could see everything before. Anyway. And he seemed to like the idea that somebody was writing about him. And he, I guess he had mellowed, but you're quite right about that, because in his last couple of years, he was trying to place himself in the context of what he knew and who he knew. He worked on the telephone, but it was increasingly hard for him to answer the phone. He was lying in bed on this platform bed. 
which before the Mormon elders, uh, Jason Davis and I tried to get him down for a doctor's appointment. And it was something out of a Harry Langdon movie where we would try to bring him down and then we'd go up another ladder. It was impossible. But Harlan, his reality shrunk physically, but yeah. it expanded emotionally. His mind was as vivid and vital and exciting and engaging as ever. And you could talk to him about the wonderment. And because he wasn't writing anymore, it was like he saved it for you when we were visiting. He, he just had this ability to, to grasp onto what you, were, what you were talking about and thinking. The final thought is one of my favorite Ellison stories for the moment is the function of dream sleep. I'm not sure if everyone knows this one. He wrote it under duress. It begins with the narrator, Harlan, saying how he's waking up and just as he awoke, a maw with sharp teeth was closing in his thigh. In the course of the story, he begins to realize that this is the unexpressed grief he has for the number of people that he's lost recently. Harlan had lost a number of people recently and it swelled up in him and he emerged in this story. I don't know if I can speak for anybody else in this panel, but I have a maw of teeth in my thigh about Harlan that will not go away. I'm sorry. I want to tell one of my Harlan stories, which is the last time I talked to Harlan. Um, my partner, Karen K.G. Anderson, and I were, came up with the idea, she came up with the idea of doing a piece for Locust on readings for writers, how to do a good reading. And we decided we would get four of the best readers that we knew to talk to us about what made a reading great. And we got Andrea Harrison, and Eileen Gunn, and Neil Gaiman, and Harlan Ellis. And Karen had reviewed uh, Harlan's YouTube video on Prince, Prince Michigan and Hold the Relish, and sent it to her mother, and her mother just absolutely loved it. Her mother turned 100 just a couple of weeks ago. So we called up Harlan, because uh, I've known him for a while, and you can do that if you know Harlan. And after insulting her at the start, they started talking. And she's Jewish and gave right back with it. And Harlan gave us one of the most engaging and exciting and <clears throat> interviews that it's possible to imagine. It was inspirational. He was talking about how he listened to Edward R. Murrow as a kid and enjoyed hearing This Is London. And that's how he learned the voice. And he finished with something that ended up finishing our article, which is, he said, tell them that the audience wants them to succeed. Mm -hmm. The audience is on their side. Mm -hmm. And you just have to not lose them. And I think that in that, Harlan was trying to help establish who he was for a new generation of people. And as an example of how inspirational he was, the minute we finished the interview, Karen said to me, go away. <laughs> she had a story forming in her head. She had to sit down and write it while her own voice was still in her mind. I went away, she wrote it, and it's not published yet, but boy, it's a brilliant piece. Mm. And Harlan shows up in it, and I think that he would be really happy. We are now more than halfway through the time we have. One of the functions that Memorial usually has is a chance for the people in the audience to say something. I'm not sure we can manage that in here because we don't have enough room for people to get up here. So I'm going to ask the people on the panel who haven't said something about Harlan's writing and how it affects Ooh, yeah. to actually say something. Because as Harlan said, what matters most is the work. What he's going to be remembered for is what he wrote and how that affected people. And I just talked about Prince Nishkin and Old the Relish, which, as I say, Karen's mother was just totally blown away with. You know, his Jewish background is very strong in a lot of his fiction. Mm -hmm. And I've been rereading Love Ain't Nothing But Sex and the Spell, and there are some really emotionally engaging stories in there. Put it that way. Um, Bob, you want to say something about Harlan's fiction? 
Well, Harlan and I were very different as writers. Our styles are different, our approaches are different. And though he wanted my approbation and constantly showed me his new work, I often didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and I told, we told each other no lies. One time he was writing a story called Deathbird. He wrote it at my house. And he stayed in the back room there and talked away. And finally brought the manuscript out to me. And I was sitting out by the pool and he handed it to me. And I read it and I didn't like it at all. Uh, my background is Ivy League literary major, uh, Kafka, Mon, Joyce, Sophocles, his background was Batman, the Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> he had comic book sensibility that I totally lack, and I have arty sensibility that he didn't want. And so I read the Death Bird, Death Bird, and I thought, man, it's a comic book story. He came out to the pool when I had finished and said, Bob, what should I do with it? I said, burn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't. No, he didn't. He had it published in one of Hugo. <laughs> so we agreed to disagree about Death Bird. He later would tell the story, hardly told a lot of fibs. <laughs> no. Tell the story that I had thrown the manuscript in the pool after reading it. And I didn't do that. Uh, for one thing, it would have been disrespectful. It was his manuscript, uh, which one of you would probably pay $10,000 for now. I, I wouldn't throw it away. And for another, it was my pool. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, I, I just said burn it, but he, over the years, transmuted that into... Uh... However, there are other stories that weren't death bird. And one day I sat down and read a whole bunch of his stories. And like uh, Drift on the Isles of the Langerhans, and I forget the names. They were long Ellisonian names now, and I forget a lot of stuff nowadays. Wonderful titles. And wonderful titles, wonderful stories. And I wrote him a letter. I said, sit down before you read this. Because <laughs> he knew that I disliked most of his stories. I've just read five of your stories that I think are five of the most brilliant science fiction stories I've ever read. And I listened to them and I explained what I thought about them. And I just thought you ought to know that because I don't want you to go down to your grave thinking I've hated every word you've written. <laughs> well, he knew I hadn't hated every word, but we, we had a stylistic gulf. And yes, Bird at Harlem. When do you go? <laughs> <laughs> um, Harlan read one of his stories at Thanksgiving dinner, and somebody here is going to know the name because I don't think it's the man who wrote, wrote Christopher Columbus uh, a short. It's the one that takes place in a map shop. Yeah, um, it's, it's at least 10 years ago because it was, as we say in our lives, before the fire. And, um, uh, but he, he brought it to dinner and, and asked if you know we would mind hearing it. And it was a group of about 20 people, so nobody minded. And the, my, my, my fondest memory about this was my then, how old is he now, like early 20s son, correcting something in it. That, <laughs> no, it's not Asgard, it's Mythgard, or, you know, some other reference to the Thor universe. Um, and and uh, he was very pleased, my, my son was very pleased with himself for having caught that, that moment. Um, I know you wanted us to tell our own stories, but I think I would be remiss without talking about my husband editing Harlan for the comic books. Uh, because much like my husband when we, Harlan I don't think ever met a deadline he really liked. Uh, <laughs> And Len came out, there, there's many stories about Harlan and the promised comic to Julie Schwartz, <laughs> but uh, the story that Len kept talking about was how he came out to California and literally was like holding Harlan to the chair to make him finish a story that Harlan wanted to write, but just somehow or another couldn't get around to finishing it. And, um, you know, the... the 
uh, he loved he loved the comics. He was a DC guy, not a Marvel guy. Um, and uh, he met Len, Len and Harlan met because Len early on in his career was writing a bunch of one pagers for like House of Mysteries and House of Secrets, and this guy comes tearing into the DC offices and goes, "I gotta punch you in the face." And, basically, and, and he's like, you stole my work. And, and I looked at him and go, who the hell are you anyway? And uh, he's like, well, you, it, was a, it was an end of the world story, you know, uh, that ends with my name is, you know, Adam, my name is Eve. And Harlan apparently had written one, which is, hi, my name is Adam. And she says, my name is Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> And Lynn had to explain to him that, yeah, it's a trope, Harlan. You know, this is this is the only way it's going to end is, you know, this little shaggy dog. Um, Lynn and I, and I say I because I actually was part of the process, adapted one or two stories for Harlan Ellison's Dream Corridor. Um, I did the scut work of breaking it down, and I, I it's and they were both shaggy dog stories. One of them being does it. The, the last line being, does a dinosaur think? Yes, but not very fast. Um, and I can't remember the other one, but he was, uh, he, he, you know, I loved his titles, I loved his stories, and, um, and I liked his television work a lot, which is where I was first, you know, first introduced to him. But, um, man, it's just, it's like, I, I, I just, I can see in my mind's eye the piles of paper on the on the rails in his office, on the on the table in the kitchen, of stuff that was meant to be gotten to. Yeah, yeah, um, I'd like your pet. Yeah, so. there was. Uh, we'll be back in a I had I had uh, written a story and I, and I mentioned Harlan peripherally in it, and so he was going to mention me in a story which he never finished. Mm. But essentially, it was when the gunfire broke out in the theater, Harlan told me to duck, and I didn't. And that was the first page of the story. And I kept, Harlan, I, please finish this story. I want to find out, you know, I did I survive, you know? <laughs> um, now, I, I uh, grew up with uh, traditional nuts and bolts science fiction, um, Heinlein and... and uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke and Murray Leinster and Robert Silverberg, who has since left us. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I was hoping he'd be here, and, and, and so I could rave about the Thirteenth Immortal, and, and that was his first novel, and he hated it for years. Um, but and then all of a sudden, in the early '60s, the mid '60s, there's this new thing, and Judy Merrill is talking about it in her year's best anthologies. What is this new thing? And all of a sudden, I'm seeing this these stories by Harlan Ellison that are not traditional science fiction. And and how am I, as a science fiction reader, a science fiction fan? supposed to, you know, it's like my mind cannot assimilate these stories. And it was a major moment. It's kind of like, you know, being a Beatles fan and, and if you're not old enough to get this and suddenly you've gone from Revolver and Rubber Soul and you buy, you buy Sgt. Pepper. And oh boy, a new Beatles album. You put Sgt. Pepper. What the hell is this? <laughs> And, and it takes you about, you know, five or six or seven listenings, you know, uh, um, back to back. And so, oh, wait, I'm starting to get it. Yeah. And it was that with Harlan's writing. And then with Dangerous Visions, I finally got it, what that he had said to the science fiction universe. He said, look, it's bigger. Get out of this little, he would use the term ghetto, get out of the ghetto get out and challenge the rest of the world. Get out there and write bigger and better. And I think in terms of, because the question was how did it impact your writing, is like I suddenly realized, he's saying come out of the closet, get, get out there, liberate yourself, write that stuff that no one else is writing, write that stuff that people are afraid to publish, change the world, write who you are, not what they want. And and I, I would say that the impact of Harlan on my writing is I would not be here today. I, mean, I don't even know if I'd have succeeded as a writer I, or if what I was writing would e even be worth reading uh, until I got kicked in the head by Harlan Ellison's writing. So imagine this. You're, you're 13, 14 years old. You're black, you're kind of middle class. 
and you've read A Boy and His Dog. It's all downhill from here, isn't it? <laughs> Not quite. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get a hold of the Hugo winners when the uh, Science Fiction Book Club first did them uh, in, in two volumes. They screwed up the end by not putting in Fritz Lieber's Ship of Shadows, but that's water under the bridge. So the two stories I think that most inspire me are Repent Harlequin Said the TikTok Man, yes. one of the great mm -hmm. short stories mm -hmm. ever. That, that story continues to astound me, you know, all these years later. And the other one is uh, Paladin of the Lost Hour, which was dramatized on the new Twilight Zone. And uh, I, I actually, uh, actually saw the show first before I read the story, but the story, good God. I, I, I can't not picture anyone playing that soldier except Glenn Turman now. Uh, I, I heard that Harlan was not too enthusiastic about Danny Kaye's performance as the older man, but Down in the Lost Hour and Repent Harlequin is just, uh, if, any, if, if anyone else just published those two stories, they surely would be famous, but yeah. he went way beyond that, yeah. way, way beyond that. In addition to the stories mentioned, I think of Grail, I think yes. of the whimper of whipped dogs, of course. Yeah. Having lived in New York, that was visceral for me. The thing that... <laughs> look, I'm, I'm known primarily as a uh, non-fiction writer. I'm not known as a fiction writer, although some people have accused me of it. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that pissed me off about Harlan was she went with the first draft. If you look at oh, some yeah. of his manuscripts, his, his second draft consisted of uh, correcting punctuation. Um, that's like remarkable. The, like, like Mozart, you know, he just came out and was immediately, now a lot of that was because he was past deadline. And, he had to <laughs> and even the Harlan Ellison first draft is better than anybody else's reworked draft. But in reading a lot of these all at once for the, for the book, and I'm not a, a literary person in the sense of deconstructing his stories, and my mind was so messed up by the 1970s that I can't give you specific titles. But the overall impression I get of a lot of his work that I was reading was that a lot of it is father quest. Mm. Harlan lost his beloved father when he was 14, 15 years old. And I think he spent the rest of his life trying to connect with the man that he never really got to know as well as the man that he admired. And he does this in his stories by talking about people, by talking about families and uh, of searching for the father figure, whether it's underwater, in the air, or inside. And that defines Harlan for me as a man who was searching for something but found another way to talk about it. I can't give you line readings for his work, but I will tell you one interesting thing, and it, it does come from those of you who've heard him reading his stories. He wrote music. You can read these stories out loud. They will make linear sense. They will hit you in the gut. They brought me to tears, and I've gasped many times just reading them. I record books on tape, and I couldn't dare do Harlan because he did it better than anybody. But I've learned to read with expression as the writer wrote, and Harlan was there with that damn first draft. He, something came right out of his heart, through his fingers, there in the paper. You could read his stories out loud, but nobody did it better than he did. Oh. No. Mm -hmm. He was an incredibly splendid actor. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he would, at a convention, read a story of his and I would be overwhelmed by the story, and then later I would read it and I'd think, this is no good at all. <laughs> <laughs> I often wondered if he took the opportunity of reading it to rewrite it in his mind as he was speaking it, but he claimed he never did. I don't think he did. Yeah. And though he did only one draft, he, he was not a quick writer the last 30 years of his career. I mean, Chris talks about Lynn Ween holding him down in his chair. I never did that. But I said he wrote Deathbird uh, at my house, and I virtually had him locked in the back room. And I, I would not allow him to come out even for meals until he, he had done the day's stint. And uh, there was another one. Uh, when He did a wonderful anthology, the best shared world anthology ever done, called Medea, which through typical 
Ellisonian self-destructiveness has been kept out of print all these years because he won't allow it to be republished. He wouldn't allow it to be republished except on his terms, and nobody would meet his terms. I'll talk to Susan about that. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> We'll talk to Susan about that. Okay. Well, anyway, he wrote the final story of Medea on my premises. And again, in the back room, he brought the manuscript out to me. I thought, this is, this is very good. I had one small change, and I, I acted out the small change. I'm not nearly the, the actor or the reader that he was, but I was pretty good at it. And he said, yeah, that's right. And I don't think I ever, in all our 65 years, heard him say to me, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, in, in 1974, I was uh, uh, producing a show called Land of the Lost for Sid and Marty Croft. <laughs> oh, some of you have seen it. OK, good. Yeah. So, um, the ones who didn't applaud. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so, I, went up, so I, I, I went up to Harlan's house, and I don't remember exactly the circumstance, but Ben Bova was up there, and uh, I, I wanted to get a, an outline, a, a story from Harlan for the show, because my goal was to only get science fiction writers doing scripts. So I got Norman Spinrad and Dorothy Fontana and uh, Theodore Sturgeon, actually Weena Sturgeon, Ted's wife, and uh, Larry Niven, and uh, I'm forgetting who else, but I only wanted science fiction writers, which is why that first season was so good. And so I went up to Harlan's house, and Harlan immediately turned me down. He said, absolutely not. And suddenly he leaps up from the couch and runs upstairs and, we hear, and Ben and I are left downstairs. So Ben and I had a great time chatting and Ben said, can I do a story for the show? I said, absolutely. I would love to have a story from Ben Bova. And, and he did a very, very nice episode. But um, after, it, yo, so Ben and I are talking and two things happen. Uh, first, at one point I look up and there's this little Jewish man in a bathrobe and slippers going into the kitchen and getting some seltzer and then walks back. And, and I thought, what happened to Harlan? Where's Harlan? There's, who is this little Jewish man getting seltzer and then he goes and then we hear typing against oh that was the other Harlan and <laughs> when he's not on and we hear tap, 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 and then Harlan's comes down with a three page outline uh, it, it took him maybe 30 minutes and I, I start reading, and, and the first act is, is the kids from Land of the Lost uh, discover this cave, and in the second act, they, they just see this wonderful thing inside the cave, and I'm really excited. This is going to be a great episode. I turn the page, and it says, I tie up everything neatly in the third act. Trust me. <laughs> Is the phrase "shit happens here," <laughs> and I and I looked at him and I said, "If I could get this past the NBC vice president, I would buy this <laughs> and force you to write this." <laughs> but you know, I cannot get. They insist on the third act. They need to know. How, and and he and he's just grinning at me because he knew he had just done one of the great literary practical jokes of all time. <laughs> But man, I still think I, if only I could have gotten that sale, I would have gotten a Harlan Ellison episode. Uh. <laughs> we are really very close to running out of time at this point. As I said, we could keep going for hours. over an hour each. Yeah. Um, I want to hope that all of you will remember Harlan, we'll talk about him, we'll share these stories, talk with people who didn't meet him talk with people who didn't know him, and find the people who did know him and share a little bit of who he was with you, because we will not see Harlan or his life again. And one, one was enough, though. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have nothing else to say after that. Yeah. <laughs> no story that's been.